Hi, my name's Nick Broughton and I'm a random fish. Hit that subscribe button and let's all be random fish together, shall we? So, what's the next film that I'm going to talk about? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so, a little while ago I went and saw a Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon. This is an interesting film, to say the least. Um, no, the Shaun the Sheep, for those of you who don't know, is a character from Wallace and Gromit. Uh, specifically, Wallace and Gromit, a close shave. Definitely one of the better side characters to come out of the Wallace and Gromit franchise, although, frankly, they're all amazing characters from that. Uh, created by Nick Park way back when, uh, Shaun the Sheep has also spawned off a cartoon series, or his own show, just called Shaun the Sheep. Uh, Sean doesn't talk either, so he... I kind of wondered how the show was going to work. I caught an episode not that long after it sort of started airing on CBBC because I was incredibly bored at the time. And honestly, it worked. Because Sean only communicated through bleating, as well as all the other sheep that he was friends with on the farm. The pigs that he was kind of enemies with only communicated through the roinking. The dog was very much, he barked occasionally, but he was more of a reactional base, so it's, oh, 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 a lot of that. And the farmer, the guy who actually ran the place and was the only real human in the show, never spoke a word either. He talked through grunts and movements and various reactional facial expressions, which I have to say, is possibly one of the best things you could have done with the show. And it f it figures that it would work well, especially in something like this, in this kind of a movie. Now, the movie is just over an hour. It's not a massively long film, but it is a good... It is definitely a good film. And you can tell that they did their best with every single frame that they made of this thing. So, what's the plot? Well, the plot is is that Sean and the others are having fun on the farm like they usually do, and they run into an alien who crash-landed on Earth. Uh, Sean befriends the alien, and the alien sort of does makes this whole sort of not-through-words case about trying to get to their ship again so they can go home. Sean, of course, agrees to take them back to the ship and everything else, and, you know, hilarity ensues involving... Uh, the alien getting hyper after drinking far too much candy and drinking a large amount of fizzy drinks, which is a very fun concept to have. Um, the alien kind of mimics other characters, which is kind of cool to see. <laughs> One of the best things ever was when they first meet, uh, Sean bleats in surprise and the alien bleats back because, you know, it's mimicry and it was really well done. Um, epically fun to learn. Uh, they get to the ship and they try and get back to the planet and various other hilarity stuff ensues including actually uh, an alien task force that turns up as well because obviously the flying saucer when it lands it attracts a lot of attention from various people especially from a slightly insane man who bought chips and was walking home and the dog ran off and started barking at the ship and this is all in the beginning of the film the dog is barking, barking, then the guy comes over to sort of see what the heck is going on with this dog, and he looks up and he sees this alien, he freaks out, he runs away. Um, and he drops the chips, and there's a rather brilliant moment in the film where he stops, and then goes back, despite running away from what he perceived to be a, a legitimate alien threat, runs back to his chips and tries picking them up, and blowing on them, and trying, still trying to eat them, you know. Um, <laughs> For a lot of Americans, you probably you may not get that ultimately, although, frankly, fast food addiction does run in America, I have to say. Um, but in England, we do seem to have this fascination with fish and chip ships. Just sort of sitting there with them in the big bags and the big paper, you know, the big bits of paper. And sort of, yeah, we like the chips. The chips are nice and everything else. And it's lovely jubbly. Um, but anyway, no, the reason why I was bringing that up is that the, the man sees the UFO and he starts talking about it in the paper and everything else. And that's why this alien task force comes in and starts trying to find the alien. Uh, the leader of it is a, a stern looking woman who's trying to, he's trying to capture the alien because she saw an alien when she was a kid. And when she told her, her classmates about it when she was a little girl, they all laughed at her. And she, I wouldn't say vowed revenge, but vowed that she would prove alien life existed. It's all very 
cleverly, I say cleverly, very well described through visuals. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. There's a mass, a, a mass of sci-fi references. Uh, there's a bit where they're flying around in a, in a, in a giant dumpster, in a dumpster, in a giant bin. And they're flying and they go past the sign of the moon. You know, nice little E.T. reference. Um, there's two Doctor Who references in there. One of them is uh, Dalek that turns up at when all these guys turn up and sort of go, it's an alien, man, oh my god. And they all turn up and wanting to find, wanting to see the alien and, and all this sort of thing. Um, uh, the other one, which is a bit more obscure actually, is that when they're on the ship, they're, um, the alien is flittering through stuff trying to find the thing that'll help make the ship go. And she brings up the uh, one of the Doctor's sonic screwdrivers, bizarrely enough. Uh, it's the fourth Doctor's, I believe. The third and fourth Doctor's uh, sonic screwdriver, which is a very cool thing to see, actually. It really was. Um, the side plot, if you will, the main plot is Sean trying to get the alien home. Uh, the dog ends up sort of finding out what's going on and, you know, tracks them down and blah, 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 blah. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that you have um, a side plot, which is the farmer sees all of this going down and his reaction. I thought his first reaction was, I'm going to capture the alien and make a lot of money. No, 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 no. He decides to build an alien theme park type thing or like an alien fair. Um, and he charges people £30 to get in. And it's just really crappy the entire time. And it's brilliant because these guys are wandering, like they pay 30 pounds, they go, yeah, this is gonna be amazing. They walk in and it's awful. Abs like, it looks like the really bad fates you used to see when you were younger, like when you would go to, like the ones at the schools that had about, you know, 24 hours to prepare everything in one shot, you know. The ones that just didn't really care. Um, and it was brilliant because they all look at this dismal excuse for a fate and they turn around and he's been on a giant sign that just says no refunds. And it was, I just kind of laughed at that because my head just went, oh my God, that's the British economy in a nutshell. Just give money to a pointless call and then complete, you know, it's like still no refunds. It's fine. No refunds. Um, but, oh my God. Um, there's, a wonderful thing in there because you get the the, the main the, the alien herself is called uh, Lula. Uh, she is or he is it, it's probably a she actually, um, but it's essentially a child like an infant alien uh, who accidentally turned on the ship on their home planet and flew to Earth. Uh, Mummy and Daddy haven't quite woken up. I kind of laughed at this because of this whole thing about being like time dilation is so different between the two planets because it's been at least a day, maybe longer, while the alien's been on Earth with Sean and the others, and her parents still haven't woken up from their sleeping. That, to me, completely threw me. Either like, the, the, time for, the time zones must be so different, and it's brilliant. Um, but it was still a lot of fun to sort of watch, and you know, there's a giant mech involved in this film near the end. Um, there's an in, there's an interesting lesson along the lines of going you can't just do whatever you want all the time because if you do then you end up in a lot of trouble but then there's those people who take their power a little bit too far this is sort of the story between sean and the dog mostly because the dog is meant to be sort of the caretaker of the farm and the caretaker of sean and the others and he's constantly saying don't do this don't do that don't do this and sean's getting more and more aggravated about the whole thing and Eventually, when they're on the when they're on the alien ship, he does something very stupid that end that causes the ship to crash, and the dog kind of goes, the dog kind of gives him that look of being like, if you hadn't been so eager to sort of just disobey me for the sake of the fact that you just thought it'd be fun, this would not have happened. Um, which is a I think is a good lesson for kids, and like I said, it's done without with just visual storytelling which is a fantastic thing to do. And it kind of all leads into something that I think is becoming a bit of a lost art form in this world. And that is just the aspect of visualization. When we 
transcribed ourselves into a into the sound era of film. Everyone became more obsessed with the audio, with the talking of the film. And I'm not going to lie, it's it's good. It's better to have sound film than silent film. I don't dispute that at all. I love films that are nothing but talking. I love Clerks, for example. Um, I think Star Wars would have been a lot less interesting if it was a silent film. But every so often it is nice to see something that is not afraid to just be maybe not a silent film, but close enough to being a silent film that it, it doesn't apologize for it. Uh, which again is something that I think is is something that not a lot of people do anymore. And I think that's a wasted opportunity. I really do. But you know what? Um a Shaun the Sheep movie, Farmageddon, oh, by the way, that's the reason why it's called Farmageddon, is that that's what the, the farmer calls his little fate theme park thing. Uh, he calls it Farmageddon. Um, there's so many visual jokes in the film, I can't really do justice by just talking about them to you guys, so if you haven't seen it yet, I do recommend going to see the film. Um, it's very silly that, you know, I'm a 29-year-old man and I'm talking about going to see Shaun the Sheep, Farmageddon. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. No, um, it's a, it, it is. It's a good movie. It's not a revolution in terms of visual-only storytelling, but it is definitely a step in the right direction. The show, I think, is definitely a step in the right direction, and I think it's wonderful that we do this and we do that sort of thing, especially nowadays for kids. I think kids knowing about having a purely visual storytelling motif, that's not a bad thing. Um, actions speak louder than words, and I do think that's something that a lot of people just have to learn to deal with and focus and everything else. But, you know what? Go and see the film. Figure it out for yourself. Enjoy it, don't enjoy it. Um, if you come across any large amounts of sci-fi references, please reference them down in the comments below. Um, Next time I do this, do another video, I'm going to try and do something a little bit more, um, I'm going to try and do something that's a bit more British, a lot more British. I know this is a very British thing, because Shaun the Sheep and Wallace and Gromit are by very British shows. Um, at least, to my knowledge, they've always been British shows. If they're not, please correct me in the comments. Um, but honestly, yeah, go check it out. Check out the film. It's... Ridiculous, but in the best way possible. So, with that being said, I'm going to simply quote the film and say, Zoom, zoom! Random fish out.